Hey everybody. How's it going today? Good. So I'm a public historian, and like most people, I really love to talk about the work that I do, even when they don't really want to listen. One night at a dinner party, a friend of mine said, hey, Adam, no matter what we talk about tonight, don't bring up those Confederate memorials. A person joining us is really sensitive about that topic. Of course, I introduced myself. I was very polite. And I said, hey, did you hear they took down Jefferson Davis last night? <laughs> you should have seen my friend's face. She reminded me a lot of Stephanie Tanner from Full House. And at that moment, I realized that monuments had been shunned from the dinner table, put into the same box as politics and religion, one of those things you just don't talk about. But the problem with that is that communities must justify the reverence or the removal of these monuments. To help with that, I've developed a conversational toolbox. The first thing in this toolbox is to understand why we memorialize to begin with. But before we get there, let's talk about memory. Each and every one of us has individual memory. It's how you experience your life. It's how you remember people and places. Your memory is unique to you. But public memory is how communities remember places and people. It's how communities experience growth. You see, monuments are built to reflect the public memory of a specific time and place. They can be as enormous as the 9-11 memorial. This serves a national audience for a tragedy on a national scale. Each and every one of you in here very likely remembers exactly what you were doing that day. Your memory, your experience, is different from the person sitting next to you. But we all collectively share an understanding about what happened and its impact on American society. On the other hand, monuments could be as small and as localized as the boll weevil. This monument is located in Enterprise, Alabama. You see, this town was devastated by a swarm of boll weevils in the 1800s, and it destroyed their cotton crop. This required the community to change their entire industry. And to memorialize that innovation, they built this monument in the center of town. So regardless on the size or the significance of the event, we as communities remember a shared understanding of events that happen in our lifetimes. So this brings us to the next point, that monuments have been removed for just as long as they've been built. See, the issue with public memory is that it always changes because communities are always changing. People move in and out. Generations have different perspectives. Communities change for all sorts of reasons. Maybe it's military victories. This is the destruction of the swastika at the Nazi parade grounds toward the end of World War II. Maybe it's political change. This is the statue of Joseph Stalin after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. How about something like rebellion? This is the destruction of the King George statue in New York City. This is the American Revolution. We remove monuments because they no longer re represent our community's values. This brings us to the next item. History is not taught at monuments. One of the biggest arguments 
that we see today is that if we remove these Confederate monuments, if we remove any monuments, we're erasing history. This argument is very complex, and it's, it makes this conversation very, very difficult. So let's critically analyze it, and let me ask you two questions. First, where do you learn history? Here you would say universities, schools, books, films, documentaries, and even museums if you come and visit. In general, in general, we learn history from both formal and informal educational settings. Our next question is how do you remember history? Here is where things like folklore and traditions and street signs and even monuments and memorials all reside. Let's be completely honest. You cannot learn all the complexities of the civil rights movement by visiting the Martin Luther King Memorial. You also can't learn it by walking down Martin Luther King Drive. These two things, the monument and the street name, honor the man for his role in the civil rights movement but it also influences how you remember it. This brings us to the last and probably the most critical point of this conversational toolbox. It's the importance of context. Anytime we discuss context, people very often say, hey, let's just change what the monument says. Let's just add some new text to it. That always doesn't work. Here's an example. This monument is located in Colfax, Louisiana, and it memorializes the massacre of 150 African Americans during the 1872 gubernatorial election. The monument, if you read it, it's actually to the three white guys that died, and it hails them as heroes fighting for white supremacy. Instead of removing this monument, the state of Louisiana added this marker. This marker identifies the 150 Negroes who were massacred, and it calls the massacre a victory that marked the end of carpetbag misrule. You see, what the state tried to do here is they tried to turn this monument, this place of memory, into a place of learning. But because this language cannot be adjusted or changed or adapted as the community around it changes, the marker becomes just as offensive as the original monument. Whenever we're discussing context, it's not just about what's written. It's also the context of place. This statue is called Uncle Jack the Good Darkie. He, uh, it was located in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and it was cast in 1927, and its inscription said that it was to the arduous and faithful service of the Good Darkies of Louisiana. As you can imagine, by the 1960s, this language was wildly offensive. Eventually, the monument was removed, and it was donated to the Rural Life Museum in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Today, this monument is used to teach uh, visitors, museum visitors, about pre-industrial Louisiana society. Now, just moving something to a museum doesn't solve all the problems, but it certainly is a step in the right direction. So let's revisit our toolbox. You now have all of the tools necessary to have a successful conversation about monuments and memorials. But how do you know when to pull it out of your tool shed? How do you know when to open it up? How do communities decide what is appropriate? 
To answer that question, let's go back to New Orleans for just one minute. In 2017, the city removed four Confederate memorials. One that they left was Andrew Jackson. Now, Jackson is not a Confederate, but he was a slave owner. But the city of New Orleans does not remember him for that. The New Orleans community remembers him for his role as the savior of the city in the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812. This is the same man that also killed tens of thousands of Native Americans across the southeastern parts of the United States. So putting up a monument to Andrew Jackson in those Creek and Seminole communities in southern Alabama and Florida would be pretty inappropriate, downright offensive. But some people have said that if we allow these Confederate monuments to be removed, then George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, they're sure to be next. Yeah, they were slave owners. But again, that's not how the national community remembers them. We remember them for their role as founding fathers. If you think your community just simply can't have this conversation, I'm going to argue that you're wrong. Every single community is going to have to have this conversation, whether it's about Confederate generals or founding fathers or the boll weevil. Luckily for my friend, the conversation that I started at dinner stayed very civil, very cordial, I promise. And, but we enjoyed the safe privacy of someone's dining room to have this very difficult conversation. But for those of us who live and work among these monuments, this topic is too important to ignore. We must engage in these conversations, because it's our job as a society to constantly reevaluate what we may find appropriate, inappropriate, or downright wrong, or even inaccurate. Confederate monuments are difficult to talk about. But armed with this toolbox, I believe that we can all agree that monuments in our communities should reflect the values and the memory in which they exist.